الحمد لله الذي وهب لي على الكبر إسماعيل وإسحاق إن ربي لسميع الدعاء رب جعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ولا تحسبن الله غافلا عما يعمل الظالمون إنما يؤخرهم ليوم تشخص فيه الأبصار مهطعين مقنعي رؤوسهم لا يرتد إليهم طرفهم لا يرتد إليهم طرفهم وأفئدتهم هواء إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تمتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل الضلالة في النار أما بعد Getting to paradise and escaping the hellfire should be the primary goal and objective of every Muslim. It is the ultimate triumph, the ultimate success. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم كل نفس ذائقة الموت وإنما توفون أجوركم يوم القيامة فمن زحزح عن النار وأدخل الجنة فَمَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَنِ النَّانِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازْ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْخُرُورِ Every soul will taste death. And indeed you will be paid in full on the day of judgment. Whoever is removed from the hellfire and allowed to enter into paradise, then he has achieved the ultimate success. Whoever is removed from the hellfire and allowed to enter into paradise, then indeed he is truly successful. And this is something that we have to constantly remind ourselves of because the society that we live in and the warped thinking of many of the people that live in it, 
They have their own standards of what success is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here clarifies the ultimate success that you can achieve is to be removed from hell and allowed to enter into paradise. Then and only then can you say that you have truly attained success. Paradise is the sole reason that many of us became Muslim. However, after becoming Muslim, many of us lose sight of the objective. We become preoccupied by everything else and everyone else instead of the initial reason that we took Shahada to begin with. Paradise is the reason that we took Shahada. Paradise is the reason that many of us endure with grace the trials and the tribulations that confront us in this dunya. Getting to paradise is what causes that spiritual endurance, which causes us to develop ourselves in the midst of this endurance as Muslims to get better so that we can prepare ourselves for that eventual test, which is to go across the bridge over the hellfire. This dunya is a test. This life is a test. Everything that we experience in, in it is a test. And the test can be used for our personal development, for us to get better, and for us to put us in a better position whereby we can obtain paradise. The same trials and tribulations that confront us in this life, they confront other people as well. And people who don't believe in paradise, or people who believe that paradise is too far-fetched for them right now, or people who believe that the trials and tribulations of this life is not worth tolerating for the luxury or the comfort of paradise. The same paradise that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا لَا عَيْنٌ فِيهَا مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذْنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَمَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرٍ With the Prophet ﷺ, he said that in paradise is what no eye has ever seen, what no ear has ever heard, and what no mind of any human being can conceive. The Prophet وسلم, he gave us a clear description of paradise, which we're going to talk about. But we have to understand that paradise is not going to be given to us. You will earn paradise, or you will fall by the wayside like the others who failed to work for it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the human being can have nothing except what he strives for. The human being can have nothing except what you work for. And your work, your work ethic, you will see the end result of it on the day of judgment and you will be paid in full. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not shortchange any one of us. You will be paid in full for what you worked for. Getting to paradise is also, uh, getting to paradise is also something that will not be obtained or, or be achieved except by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in addition to what we work for. Even if you work and you exert and you exuberate all of yourself to get to paradise, you will still not obtain paradise except by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is so that we do not become deceived, self-deception by our deeds. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, as it was mentioned in an authentic hadith collected on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Len لا يدخل يدخل أحدهم أحد عمله الجنة قالوا ولا أنت يا رسول الله قال لا ولا أنا إلا أن يتغمدني الله بفضل ورحمة فسددوا وقاربوا. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that none of you will enter into paradise solely based upon your deeds. None of you. None of you will enter into paradise solely based upon your deeds. They said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah. He said, not even me. 
unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers me with his mercy and his bounty. That is the way that you will get to paradise. Through hard work and through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And getting to paradise is not going to be an easy task. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us, حُفَّةَ الْجَنَّةَ بِالْمَكَارِحِ وَحُفَّةَ النَّارِ بِالشَّهَوَاتِ the Prophet ﷺ said that paradise is surrounded by all difficult things. While the hellfire is surrounded by all of the things that the soul desires and covets. All of the things that you desire, all of the things that we want, that is what the hellfire is surrounded with. Paradise is surrounded by difficulty, trial, tribulation. This is what paradise is surrounded by. The getting up at the third of the night when you really want to sleep. The making wudu when it's cold outside and you would rather just make tayammum. The getting up and walking to the masjid when you don't have a vehicle. Walking to the furthest masjid as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned to us the benefit in al-masjid al-ab'ad, the masjid that is farther away because with every footstep you take towards the masjid you are raised a degree with Allah and you are removed from sin and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you for every footstep that you take towards the masjid. All of the difficult things, the fasting on Mondays and Thursdays when we want to indulge, Fasting during the month of Ramadan, when we would rather eat, act like we're fasting, but eat behind the scenes. I can't do it this year. Allah have mercy upon me. Remember, the next time we want to slack in something, that paradise is surrounded by the difficulties. Paradise is surrounded by the things that are difficult on the soul. And every time we challenge our soul, every time you challenge yourself to do better, you get one step closer to making things easier on you and you get one step closer to paradise. Every time we think about getting weak, we decide to let our desires take the best of us. I'm not going to pray today. Allah have mercy on me. Make dua for me. Every time you feel like getting weak, remind yourself that paradise is surrounded by the difficult things. And that paradise will be achieved by what you, put, what you strive for and through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So paradise will not be obtained with a lack of exuberance and with a person just being mediocre and just settling for the bare minimum. Paradise is a wide place and there's levels in the paradise for people who decide and to take a, who make a sound decision to work for it. The Prophet وسلم, mentioned an authentic hadith on the authority of Usama ibn Zayd رضي الله تعالى عنهما قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لأصحابه ذات اليوم ألا مشمرون للجنة فإن الجنة لا خطر لها ورب الكعبة نور يتلألأ وريحان تهتز وقصر مشيد ونهر مطرد وفاكهة كثيرة نضيحة وزوجة حسنة جميلة وحلل كثيرة ومقام عبدا في حبرة ونظرة في دار العالية السليمة بهية قالوا يا رسول الله نحن مشمرون لها فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قولوا إن شاء الله قولوا إن شاء الله The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he stood up and addressed his companions on one day and he said ألا مشمرون للجنة Is there not an individual from amongst you who is prepared to work for paradise? Is there an individual from amongst you who is prepared to work for paradise? He said, for wallahi, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, there's nothing comparable or equivalent to the paradise. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would know best. He saw paradise. He saw some of the things in paradise. He was making prayer with his companions one day. And he took a step backwards. And then he took a step forward while he was in salat. And some of the companions asked him, we noticed in the prayer, you took a step back and then you took a step forward. He said, because when we were in the prayer, I took a step back because I saw the hellfire. And I took a step forward because I saw the paradise. He saw the paradise. He saw some of the mansions. He saw some of the treasures of the paradise. He said, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba that there is no equivalent 
to the paradise. And that in the paradise is light. It's a radiant, shining light. In the paradise is a fragrance that you have never smelled before. Rather, every step that you take in paradise, every time you take a step on the soil in paradise, the smell of musk comes up into your nose. With every step that you take. He said, in paradise, al-Mashid, they are imposing mansions. There are mansions that are bigger than the eyes can see. Magnificent mansions. Fakihatun and a lot of fruits and vegetables. Things that we are familiar with in this life. But as Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, although they share the same name, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the difference in degree. Only Allah knows the apple in paradise is not like the apple in this life. The orange in paradise is not like the orange in this life. The pomegranate in paradise is not like the pomegranate here in this life. Although they share the same name, they differ in their magnitude and their degree that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. That in paradise are beautiful women. The Prophet sallallahu informed us that the khimar, the hair, the hair piece from the woman in paradise is better than the dunya and everything in it. That if a sweat, a drip of sweat was to drip from the woman in paradise on the dunya, it would destroy the whole dunya. One drip of sweat. One tear from the woman of paradise to drip in the dunya, it would destroy the whole dunya. Because of how pure it is. That in paradise, there will be silk garments for you to wear. Unlike any garments that you have seen in this life. And you will not be asked to leave. You will remain there in forever. No one will ask you to get out of paradise. And you will be salim. You will be free, protected from anybody's tongue, from anybody's hand, from anybody's harm. Because the only people that will be allowed to enter into paradise are those who love one another. There will be no enmity and hatred in paradise. And that's why the people who have enmity and hatred for one another in this dunya, their deeds are on hold until they rectify what is between them. You will not, there will be no hatred or jealousy or animosity or enmity in paradise. That's only in this life. So the companion said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi O Messenger of Allah, we are indeed prepared to work for paradise. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, say inshallah. Say inshallah. Because only Allah knows whether you're really prepared for paradise. And that's something that we need to ask ourselves. Are we prepared to work for paradise? Are we prepared to do what it takes to get to paradise? Are we prepared to make the sacrifices that are necessary to make for us to get to paradise? Paradise has eight gates, brothers and sisters. And these eight gates are mentioned by name throughout the Quran. At times they are called Jannatul Khuld, the everlasting paradise. At times it is called Dar al Salam, the place of peace and tranquility. At times they are called Dar al Qarar, the place of establishment. It is your real home. Your address where you live at in this dunya is temporary. You die today, that house goes to someone else. It's not your permanent home, it's not your permanent residence. Paradise is your permanent residence. At times it's called Jannah to Adanin. At times it's called Jannah to Ma'wa. At times it's called Jannah to Naim, everlasting bliss. At times it's called Illiyin, the high place for high people. At times it's called Jannah to Firdaus. And these eight gates of paradise, they represent the various levels of the believers based upon their due diligence and their hard work in this life. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned an authentic hadith collected in Sahih Muslim on the authority of Ubad ibn Usamit radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min qala ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah abduhu wa rasuluh wa anna Isa ibn, uh, ibn Maryam abduhu wa rasuluh wa karimatuhu alqaha ila Maryam wa ruhu min wa anna jannata haq wa anna nara haq أدخله الله من أي أبواب الجنة ثمانية شاء. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said whoever bears witness to لا إله إلا الله 
Wahdahu la sharika lah. Whoever bears witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except God. Nothing worthy of worship except Allah, the Almighty Creator. Bears witness, openly bears witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah, alone without any partners. And that is the most accurate translation that you can get of La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah does not mean that there is no God except Allah. There are gods that people worship out there other than that. When we say la ilaha illallah, we are not negating the fact that there are other gods out there. What we are negating is that those gods don't deserve worship. That's what we are negating. And we need to be clear about that. Because some Muslims, we're Muslim year after year, 20, 30 years into Islam, and you're still saying la ilaha illallah, no God but Allah. Nothing worthy of worship except Allah. There are things people worship other than Allah. Are they real gods? No. But are they gods that people have taken as worship? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions some of them in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, أَفَرَأَيْتَمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةِ وَمَنَاتِ الثَّارِثَةَ أُخْرَى Do you not see manat? Lat and uzza, which were the idols, the gods of the mushrikun. Don't you see lat and uzza and manat and another one? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in another ayat in the Quran. Don't you see the one who has taken his desires as his God besides Allah? So to translate la ilaha illallah as no God but Allah is inaccurate. And for us as Muslims, we should be aware of that. We should be aware of that. Whoever bears witness that there's nothing worthy of worship except Allah, alone without any partners. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. And that Jesus, the son of Mary, is his servant and his messenger. And if you notice in the Quran, every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Jesus' name, he mentions him, Jesus, the son of Mary. Isa ibn Maryam. And all throughout the Quran, Jesus, the son of Mary. To drive home the point that Jesus was the son of Mary, not the son of God. Far is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above what they attribute to him. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that they say that he has a son. How can that he have a son when he has no equal? He has no counterpart. He has no equal. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever bears witness that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger and that Jesus is his servant and his messenger. And the kalima, the word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conveyed to Maryam and a spirit from Adam, not a spirit from Allah, spirit from Adam. And bears witness that paradise is the truth and bears witness that the hellfire is the truth, then Allah will allow him to enter into paradise through any of the eight gates that he chooses. This is the shahada that for those of us who have converted from Christianity to Islam, this is the shahada that we should be taking. Many of us have bore witness that there's nothing worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger, but we've never clarified our position on Jesus. There may be people who are Muslims still today believing that Jesus is still the son of God. Still today as a Muslim. So when we give people shahada, this is the shahada that we want them to take. To bear witness that there's nothing worthy of worship except Allah. We only worship God alone. We don't worship anything else. We don't worship the sun. We don't worship the moon. We don't worship Muhammad. We don't worship Jesus. We don't worship any human being. As Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to his own companions, "La tatruni kama atrat al-Yahud, kama atrat al-Nasara, Isa ibn Maryam. Inna ma ana abdu Abdullahi wa Rasulu. Fakulu Abdullahi wa Rasulu." He said, "Do not raise me like the children of Israel, like the Christians raised Jesus. I'm only a servant of God. I'm only a servant of Allah. So when you address me, address me as a servant of Allah and His Messenger." But he mentioned the eight gates to enter into any, uh, through any of the eight gates of paradise that he pleases. And these eight gates show us that people in paradise are on different levels. Just as in this life, we are not going to be treated equally. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, La yastawi ashabun nani wa ashabul jannah Ashabul jannati humul faizun Say, are those equal? Those who are the companions of paradise from those who are the companions of the hellfire? Indeed, those who are the companions of the health uh, of paradise, they are the ones that are truly successful. They are not equal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the people that are going to paradise are not on the same level. Due to the fact that there were some people in this life that took that extra initiative, that took that extra step to do more. Some of us perform and practice Islam like we perform at our jobs. We're there just for the paycheck. We're there to do our eight hours and go home. We here in Islam just to do the five salats, the five basic bare minimum salat, the fasting the month of Ramadan. We don't do the bare minimum. And then we think we're going to paradise. The bare minimum. We're not doing anything extra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَصِيرُ أَفَلَا تَتَفَكَّرُونَ Say, are those, who are, are those equal, those who can see, and those who are blind? There were some in this life who chose to see. There were some in this life who chose to see this dunya for what it really was, and not to be deceived by it. Some of us in this dunya, we chose to open our eyes to the nonsense and sift through the nonsense and be upon what is correct without any personal attachment to anyone or any particular group or any particular message. We chose to see. And then there's some of us who chose to be blind. There's those of us who chose not to see. There are those of us who thought that ignorance was bliss. But even that, it has its repercussion as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قَالَ كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا فَنَسِيتَهَا وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى And whoever turns away from my remembrance, whoever acts blind in this dunya, turns away from my remembrance, then we will give him a life narrowed down. We will give him a life narrowed down. And we will raise him on the day of judgment blind. And he will turn to Allah and say, oh my Lord, why did you raise me up blind? When in this life, I could see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to him by saying, likewise, when our signs came to you, you chose to be blind. So today you will be overlooked. Today you will be blind. We will forget you just like you forgot about our signs when it came to you. Some of us chose to be blind in this dunya. And there were those of us who chose to see. There were those of us who were, quote unquote, doing us. I'm doing me right now. Later for Islam. I'm Muslim, but I'm doing me right now. Make dua for me. We chose to be blind. But that has its repercussions. And then there were those of us who chose to see. What type of person are you? Are you the person who chose to see? Are you the person that chose to be blind? To walk blindly in this dunya? To be deceived by what you see out here? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to make deal with them the same way? Absolutely not. There were some of us who chose to get up at night. While there were some of us who chose to sleep the whole night. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to deal with them equally? Absolutely not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran... أَوَمَنْ هُوَ قَائِتٌ أَنَا أَلَّيْلِ أَلَا أَلَّيْلِ سَاجِدًا وَقَائِمًا يَحْذُو الْآخِرَةِ 
يرجو رحمة ربه قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون إنما يتذكر أولو الألباب Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said can he who was obedient and got up forsaking his bed at night Sajidan, Qa'ima, prostrating, standing, fearing the hereafter, hoping for the mercy of his Lord. Can he be like the one who slept all night? Can he be equal and will be dealt with equally to the person who knows this but didn't do it? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the verse by saying, Ah, say, are those who know equal to those who don't know? Indeed, the only people who will take a reminder from this are those ulul albab, the people of intelligence. They will not be dealt with the same. There are some people who will just barely make it into paradise. And then there are those of us who will enter into paradise without any reckoning. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there will be 70,000 from his ummah that will enter into paradise. Bila hisab, wala adab. Without any reckoning, without any punishment. The gates of paradise will be open for them. So one of the companions, he stood up and he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, Urdu Allah and Yaja'alani minhum. Oh Messenger of Allah, ask Allah to make me from amongst them. The Prophet said, You are from amongst them. Another man stood up and said, Oh Messenger of Allah, make dua that Allah make me from amongst them. The Prophet said, Sabaka Ukasha. Ukasha beat you to it. But immediately, as soon as the Prophet Sallallahu said it, he knew exactly what he wanted. This is the time, this is what is called being prepared for paradise. Making those preparations, and we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make us of those who properly prepare for that paradise that is surrounded by all of the difficult things and for him to make it easy for us. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bima ja'a fihi min al-ayati wa dhikri al-hakim akunu ma tasma'oon astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'il al-mu'minin min kulli dham fastaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafuru rahim. الحمد لله العلي الجبار غافل الذنب وقابل التوب شديد العقاب وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد and when we look at the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم we see people who would stop at nothing to get to paradise we see people who competed with one another in this dunya to attain the highest place in paradise. We see people who made sacrifices that some of us would cringe at the thought of making. Given all of your wealth. The Prophet asked Abu Bakr, what did you leave for your family? He said, I left my family Allah and his messenger. People who left their families, left their homes, some women left their husbands, men left their wives. And migrated with the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca to Medina and searched for a place where they could practice their religion without, of, without all of the trials and tribulations that they experienced at the hands of the disbelievers. And there were some in this life who choose to disregard this. There are some of us who know this and know what we should be doing to get to paradise, but we choose to disregard. The gates of paradise are open at certain times for those who choose to work for it. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he mentioned in an authentic hadith, إِذَا دَخَلَ رَمَضَانْ فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ وَسُلْسِلَةِ الشَّيَاطِينَ When the month of Ramadan comes, that the doors of paradise are opened, and the gates of hell are closed, and the shayateen are chained up. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in another hadith, Showing us another time when the gates of paradise are open. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tuftahu abuwaabu al-janna yawm al-ithnayn wa yawm al-khamis wa yughfar li kulli abdin musliman la yushrik billahi shay'ah illa rajulayni 
كانت بينه وبين أخيه شحناء فيقول الله جل وعلا أو فيقال أنتظر أو أنظر هذين حتى يصطلها أنظر هذين حتى يصطلها أنظر هذين حتى يصطلها The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that the gates of paradise are opened on Mondays and Thursdays. Mondays and Thursdays, the gates of paradise are open. And these are recommended days of fasting for the Muslims. How many of us take advantage of that? Ask yourself, evaluate yourself. We, ha- we do a good job evaluating everybody else. Whether this one is on it or off it, whether his thobe is high enough, whether his beard is long enough, whether this one is practicing Islam according to the... We do a good job evaluating everybody else. Evaluate yourself. And don't look at me when you evaluate yourself. I'm a sinner like the rest of the children of Adam. So compare when you compare yourself to me, automatically you're going to compare yourself to me and look at yourself as being a mountain. Compare yourself to the best of this ummah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions. You want to see a just estimate. You want to make a just estimation of yourself. Compare yourself to Abu Bakr. Compare yourself to Umar. Compare yourself to Uthman. Compare yourself to Ali. Compare yourself to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Compare yourself to Abu Ubaidah. Compare yourself to these companions who were promised paradise. These same individuals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن That Allah is pleased with them. And they, and they are pleased with Allah. You want to justly estimate yourself. You want to be fair and honest with yourself. Compare yourself to them. But sometimes we, we estimate and we, we're evaluating everybody else. Instead of putting the concentration and the focus on us. That on, the th- on, on, on Mondays and Thursdays, the gates of paradise are open. And every Muslim servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be forgiven for his sins. With the exception of two people. With the exception of two people. And I want us to be very clear about this. Because we hear hadith all the time. And we look at hadith as just being narrations 1433 years ago. Not narrations that are applicable to us. You heard the narration. You heard it. But we disregard it because we're looking at something else. Everybody, every servant of Allah, Muslim servant of Allah will be forgiven with the exception of two people. Rajulani baina huwa baina akhihi shahna. Two individuals who there is some enmity and hatred between them. Problem between them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels, أَنْذِرُوا هَذَيْنِ حَتَّى يَصْطَلَحَ أَنْذِرُوا هَذَيْنِ حَتَّى يَصْطَلَحَ أَنْذِرُوا هَذَيْنِ حَتَّى يَصْطَلَحَ Hold off on these two until they reconcile. Hold off on these two until they reconcile. Hold off on these two until they reconcile. We will not be forgiven on Mondays and Thursdays with everyone else until we reconcile what is between us and another Muslim. This is an encouragement that if there is between you and anyone else to reconcile. And if you can't reconcile with that individual after you've exhausted all avenues to reconcile, then the only thing that you can do is make dua. Because there's some people who would rather meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with whatever enmity and hatred is between them than to work it out in this life. You would rather work it out in this life than to work it out in the hereafter. Because in the hereafter, there will be no excuses. And the hereafter, Allah will seal everybody's mouth shut and your body parts will testify against you. Your tongue will testify against you. Your heart will testify against you. All of the things that conceal our real intentions will tell, against, uh, will tell on us. We can paint a picture to the world that it's this person's fault or that person's fault or why we did this and justify that. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said, you come to me, two of you, you come to me arguing and debating. He said, وَلَعَلَّهُ أَنْ يَكُنْ أَلْحًا مِنْ صَاحِبِهِ He said, and perhaps one of you is more eloquent in your speech than the other. 
He says, so if I judge your situation and give you the right of your brother, don't take it because I'm only giving you a portion of the hellfire. Some of us are very good at our presentation, very eloquent in the way that we present ourselves. On the day of judgment, there will be no eloquence. Your mouth will be sealed shut and your body parts will testify against you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, we will say to our body parts, how can you testify against us? And our body parts will respond that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the ability to talk, the one who gives anything or anyone the ability to talk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do what he wills. And he is not to be questioned about what he does, but we will be questioned about what we do. So the Prophet wasallam said that Allah will tell the angels to hold off on these two until they reconcile. As we mentioned earlier, there will be no beef in paradise. There will be no hatred. There will not be people in paradise over in this corner hating on people over there in that corner. That's not going to happen. There will be mutahabin, loving one another. Those are the only people that will enter into paradise. As the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned in authentic hadith, لا يدخلون الجنة لا تدخلون الجنة حتى تحبوا حتى تحبوا that none of you will enter into paradise until you love one another. He said, and can I not direct you to a deed that if you do it, it will create love between you. Did he say give money? Did he say marry the brother to your daughter? Did he say go over to the brother's house and eat dinner with him every night? He said, Afshis salam bainakum. Spread the salams between you. Something as simple as that. Something as simple as spreading the salams will create an environment of love, of, uh, of compassion between us, and we have a hard time doing that. And the eight gates of paradise, they will be opened because they represent certain deeds. And we will enter into these gates based upon the deeds that we were proficient at. As the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in a hadith collected in Sahih al-Bukhari, on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. قال من أنفق زوجين في سبيل الله نودي من أبواب الجنة يا عبد الله هذا الخير فمن كان من أهل الصلاة دعي من باب الصلاة ومن كان من أهل الجهاد دعي من باب الجهاد ومن كان من أهل الصيام دعي من باب الصيام دعي من باب الريان ومن كان من أهل الصدقة دعي من باب الصدقة فقال أبو بكر يا رسول الله بي أبي أنت وأمي ما على من دعي من تلك الأبواب من ضرورة فهل يدعى أحد من تلك الأبواب كلها فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم يا أبا بكر وأرجو أن تكون منهم The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that on the day of judgment the individual will be called to the gate of paradise and whoever was from the people who used to make prayer a lot, they will be called from the gate of prayer. And whoever was some from those who used to fight jihad, fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, the greatest fight is the jihad of nafs, is the fighting yourself, that internal struggle within yourself. How are you going to go out and fight in the cause of Allah? And you have an internal struggle between you, between right and wrong. You want to do right sometimes and you want to do wrong sometimes. Fight yourself first. But the person who engaged, who was proficient at fighting for the cause of Allah, will be called from the gate of fighting of jihad. And whoever was proficient in performing a lot of fasting, then he will be called from the gate of rayan, which is one of the gates in paradise, that a person who fasted a lot will be allowed to enter through that gate. And whoever was a, was a type of person that used to give a lot of sadaqah, proficient in giving sadaqah, consistent in giving sadaqah, then he will be called from the gate of sadaqah. So Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, he said, okay, these people could be called for these gates individually. But is there an individual who can be called from all eight gates? Just to show you where his thinking was. Abu Bakr wasn't your average Muslim. He wasn't the bare minimum Muslim. He was the Muslim who wanted to go the extra mile, 
wanted paradise, wanted the highest place in paradise. I've heard Muslims make statements like, even if I go to the hellfire, I'm only going to stay there for a minute. I've heard Muslims with my own ears say that even if I go to the hellfire, I'm not going to stay there forever. The Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah will take an individual who knew nothing but good in this life. He lived a very affluent lifestyle. Had everything that a person could desire in this life would take him and dip him in the hellfire and ask him, does he know any, any hardship? And he, does he know any good? Did he ever remember any good? And he will say, no. I've never known any good in my life. Just one dip in the hellfire will make him forget everything that he's ever experienced of good. One dip in the hellfire. For a person to say, I'm going to go to hellfire, but I'm only going to be there for a moment. Or even if I go to hell, I'm going to eventually come out. The Prophet Sallallahu uncle, Abu Talib, who is the person that will be punished the least in the hellfire. The least amount of punishment is that he will be given sandals that will be made of fire and that will be so hot his brain will boil. That is the least amount of punishment a person will get in hell and he thinks that he's being punished the most. How could you utter a statement like that? I'm only going to go to hell for a minute then I'm going to come out. And then how can you guarantee yourself that? Al-ibra bil khawatim. The lesson, the main lesson that is taken from your life is what you die on. That is the lesson that is taken from your life. What you die on. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to die upon this religion of Al-Islam on obedience to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Bakr said, is it possible that a man could be called from all eight gates? Could a man reach a level where he has excelled in every level of the religion and entered through every gate in paradise? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes, Abu Bakr, and I hope that it's you. Subhanallah. These were people who worked for paradise. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, every time I try to do some good, I find that uh, um, Abu Bakr beats me to it. The Prophet Sallallahu said that he heard the footsteps of Bilal in paradise before his own footsteps. And that was because Bilal, as the Prophet Sallallahu asked him, how did your footsteps get into paradise before mine's? It wasn't because he was black. Because we like to use that hadith that Bilal was black and the black man going to be in paradise even before. See, he said that he was in paradise even before the Prophet. That doesn't give any virtue to the color of your skin of your ethnicity. What it emphasizes is the deed that Bilal did to get into paradise before the Prophet ﷺ. And what was it? Even the Prophet asked Bilal, what, what is it? How is it that I hear your footsteps in paradise before mine? What did you do? And Bilal said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I never invalidated my wudu. Except that I made wudu and I performed two rak'ah afterwards. Consistency in doing the deed. Every time he made, every time he never was out of the state of wudu. Never. Anytime he invalidated his wudu, he made wudu. And every time he made wudu, he made two rak'ah. This was the sunnah of Bilal. So we'll quote the hadith and say, Bilal is in paradise. Look at Bilal in paradise. His footsteps before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we never look at the deed that he did. And we definitely don't exemplify the deed either. How many of us can say, in all fairness to yourself, that every time you make wudu, you make two raka'ah? But I can guarantee you that most of the brothers and sisters who hear me saying this now, you know the hadith before I said it. But we don't act upon it. We don't implement it. Are we prepared for paradise? Are we prepared to make the sacrifices that are necessary for us to get to paradise? So the Prophet ﷺ told Bilal, yes, and I hope it is you. And ending the Prophet ﷺ, he said on the day of judgment, to the shams, yawm al-qiyama min al-khalq, حَتَّى تَكُونَ كَمِكْدَارِ الْمِيلِ فَيَكُونَ النَّاسِ عَلَى قَدْرِ أَعْمَالِهِمْ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَكُونُ إِلَى كَعْبَيْهِ 
ومنه من يكون إلى ركبتيه ومنه من يكون إلى حقويه ومنهم من يلجمه العرق الجاما The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said on a day of judgment the sun will be brought a mile's distance everyone will be gathered for judgment and the sun will be brought a mile's distance the sun right now is light years away from us and in the summertime we sweat profusely imagine the sun being a mile's distance from us he said and the people on that day will sweat based upon their deeds we sweat today based upon our deeds when we find ourselves in some trouble we perspire we sweat when we under pressure and there's no pressure like knowing all of the things that you did wrong in this life and knowing you're going to have to stand in front of your lord and be questioned about them there's no more pressure greater than that there's no pressure in that you saved face in this life everybody thought you were a righteous muslim everybody thought you was a good brother everybody thought that you were knowledgeable everybody thought that you were god fearing and then when you stand in front of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he exposes everything about you there's nothing there's no pressure greater than that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says some people they will sweat and their sweat will come up to their ankles and i sweat in that much they ain't really got a lot to worry about and we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are from those people we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are not those people that have a lot to worry about on the day of judgment he said and some people their sweat will come up to their shins some people their sweat will come up to their knees some people will sweat and their sweat will come up to their waist some people will sweat and it will come up to their necks and some people will just be completely drowned in their sweat the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said but there will be seven people who will be shaded on the day when there will be no shade except the shade of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there will be seven people that will earn the merit of shade of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when there will be no shade except the shade of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the next time we stand in some sun in some heat think about this hadith because the the benefit of learning the quran and the sunnah is being able to apply it to your life at the right time at the right place if that's not the goal and the objective of learning the quran and the sunnah then what's the benefit just to say that we know if we can't take it and make it relevant to our lives at the moment the time and the place where it's applicable then what are we learning for just to say what we know taking the hadith and applying it the first individual who will be shaded on the day where there will be no shade except the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Imam al-Adil is a fair imam a imam that is fair and Shaykh Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala said there's no fairness in a leader except that he judges people by the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he rules over the people by the book of Allah and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all of us and that applies to us as well as many of us are fathers many of us are husbands being fair to your children being fair if you have more than one wife being fair between your wives This is a Imam Al-Ad. The second person, Shab al-Nasha'a fi ibadat Rabbih, is a young man who was raised on obedience to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. And he maintains that. Some of you were born and raised fortunate enough to be born and raised in Islam. Some of you brothers and you sisters in here right now, you were born and raised in Islam. You will never know what it feels like to wake up every morning not knowing whether you coming or going you will never know what it feels like internally to know that you are here and you have a purpose but you don't know what your purpose is you will never know what that feels like 
You will never know what it feels like to know that God exists, but you don't know anything about him. You don't know the path to get to him. You will never know what it feels like to go through the different transitions, whether it was from the Marcus Garvey movement to the Nation of Islam to the War of Dean community to what we thought was the Sunnah to what we still think is the Sunnah. 60 years we've been deceived. You will never know what that feels like. Born and raised in Islam on the Quran and the Sunnah. Privileged. Even if you decide to deviate, you still know your way back. Privileged. And you take, you take that for granted. Some of us wasn't that fortunate. So when we come into Islam, we take this serious. It's not a joke. Some of us sacrificed our lives. We gave up women. We gave up men. We gave up whatever we gave up from the streets to become Muslim, completely obedient to Allah, to come into Islam and find people take it for a joke. To find people still fornicating, adulterating, smoking, getting high, but you Muslim. Stealing, robbing, killing people, selling drugs and poison to your people, but you Muslim. What's the, where's the Islam in that? Please tell me. Where's the Islam in that? And for someone who takes his religion serious to come into the religion of Al-Islam, and to see this, it's a complete hypocrisy. Privileged. Some of you brothers and sisters are privileged and you don't even see it. Born and raised on Islam. But if you maintain, if you maintain that, then you will be from amongst the people who will be shaded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A shab, a young man who was raised on obedience to Allah and he maintains that. The third person رَجْلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلِّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ is a man whose heart is attached to the masjid. He's attached to the salat. Time for the salat. Constantly looking at his watch. Constantly trying to make that effort to get to the masjid. His heart is attached to the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wherever they may be. Another man رَجُلَانِ تَحَابَّ فِي اللَّهِ اجْتَمَعَ عَلَيْهِ وَتَفَرَّقَ عَلَيْهِ is two men who love each other for the sake of Allah. They unite upon that and they don't separate on that until one of them dies. The only thing that separates our love for one another in Islam is death. Not because you gave me the salams wrong. Not because you walked past me and didn't give me the salams. Not because of all of the other frivolous and corny reasons that we look for to separate from one another. That's not love. You can't talk about an individual behind his back and then turn around and say, I love a brother for the sake of the law. But there's no love in that. I don't need that type of love. And I don't think anybody else needs it. That's not real love. Real love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not go away because of personal reasons between us. Those things can be rectified. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send down a disease except he sent down the cure. But the true love is two people who love each other for the sake of Allah and the only thing that separates them is that one of them dies. And even after death, it still doesn't separate because we still supplicate for you. We still uh, do good deeds for you. We still give sadaqah on your behalf. We make umrah hajj on your behalf. We help your family out. This is what we do. This fifth person, Rajulun, the fifth person who will be shaded with the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a day where there will be no shade except his shade is a man who is called by a beautiful woman a woman of high status in her society not a low life not a low life woman a woman of high status in her society, beautiful, calls you to fornicate with her and you say, no, I can't because I fear Allah. Not no, I can't because your husband home. No, I can't because I want my wife to catch me. No, I can't because, you know, the situation just ain't right at the moment. I can't because I fear Allah. I fear God. I can't do that. This is the type of individual that will be shaded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a day where there will be no shade except the shade of Allah. And I know in this society that we live in, that is very difficult. But like Yusuf alayhi salam, he said, 
that, oh my Lord, prison is more dear to me than what they call me to. I would rather be in prison than to fornicate. This is how you know that you've tasted the halawa, halawa to the iman. This is how you know you've tasted the sweetness of faith. When you would rather put yourself in a difficult situation than to be disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sixth person, رَجِلٌ تَصَدَّقَ بِصَدَقَةٍ فَأَخْفَاهَا حَتَّى لَا تَعْلَمَ شِمَالُهُ مَا تُنْفِقْ يَمِينُهُ the sixth person who will be shaded by the shade of Allah on the day where there will be no shade except his shade is a person who gave sadaqah, gave charity so secretively that his, right, his left hand didn't know what his right hand was given. Ikhlas, sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you do what you do not to be seen of men. You don't have to broadcast what you do and what you're upon and what this is about and what you're not about. You don't have to broadcast that to the world. That is between you and your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you give sadaqah so secretively that your left hand doesn't know what your right hand gives. And the last person, the seventh person that will be shaded by Allah on the day where there will be no shade except his shade. رَجْلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهِ خَالِيًا فَفَعْضَتْ عَيْنَاهُ Is a man who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he's alone and his eyes well up with tears. He begins to cry because he remembers the bounty and favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon him. He remembered that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him from here and raised him. He remembered that he was a disbeliever and Allah guided him to Islam. He remembered that he was a non-Muslim, someone who was on the brink of the pit of the fire and Allah saved him from it, not because of something that you did, but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to have mercy on you. We're not Muslims today because we did something so meritous, some so value, so it has so much value in it that Allah decided to guide us. We are Muslim today solely for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we remember that. We remember those days in Jahiliyyah when we were astray, more astray than cattle. We remember that. We reflect on that. And when we're alone, we remember that. We remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. We remember his bounty on us. We remember sticky situations that we were in. And we said, oh Allah, if you get me out of this situation, I'll never do it again. And he got you out of it. We remember those situations. And our eyes well up with tears. Because we know we didn't deserve it. And Allah still gave it to us. And we still turn right back around and be disobedient to him again. We remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in secrecy and in, in, in seclusion. And our eyes well up with tears. Remembering and reflecting on all of the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And these are the seven people that will be shaded on a day when the sun will be brought a mile's distance to the creation. And inshallah ta'ala, we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make us from all seven. Shaykh Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala he said it's possible that a person could get all seven but that a person has to work for that that is not going to be given to you there's some people from amongst us here that have done all seven that are doing all seven there's some people all of the eight gates of paradise that we mentioned that will enter through all of those gates and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those people Barakallahu li wa lakum fil quran أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المؤمنين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار Oh Allah we ask you uh, for paradise Oh Allah give us the good of this life and the good of the hereafter and save us from the hellfire اللهم إنا نعوذ برضاك من سخطك وبمعافاتك من عقوبتك ومنك منك لا نحسن ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك Oh Allah, we seek refuge with your pressure from your anger and we seek refuge with you from uh, your, your being in good standing with you from being punished by you we seek refuge with you from you we cannot enumerate the way that you deserve to be praised you will deserve to be praised the way that you praise yourself. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa taslimin kathira wa aqim as-salam.